Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Probably should have said, wait a second. <laughs> Yeah, let's start over. Who's watching? Okay. All right, we'll just we'll just leave it on. We can edit. Amanda Barnard. Hey, Amanda. Um. Thank you guys so much for joining us this. Uh, for this uh, Bible study, uh, my name is Pastor Keith. I'm with Grace Baptist Church, and I want to start off with um, with a prayer this morning. Just praying, um, actually, from uh, Psalms. Would you uh, Would you bow in prayer as we exalt our Lord? Lord, this is morning. We exalt you, our God, our King, and bless your name forever. We will bless you every day. We will praise your name forever. Lord, you are great, and you are highly praised. Your greatness is unsearchable. One generation will declare your works to the next and will proclaim your mighty acts. I will speak of your splendor and glorious majesty. In your wondrous works, they will proclaim the power of your awe-inspiring acts. I, we, will declare your greatness. They will give a testimony to your good, your great goodness, and will joyfully sing of your righteousness. So, Lord, we just exalt you this morning. Thank you, Father. It's amazing to think that your greatness is unsearchable. That just as we have spent, Lord, thousands of years exploring our universe, exploring our planet, yet there are still more things that we don't know than we do know. And Father, it's the same with you. And so Father, this morning, it's our heart's desire and passion that you would show us some ancient truths about you, some of the, the great things about you, Father. It's hidden, to the, it's hidden from the world, it's hidden from, uh, uh, from, from the hearts that, Lord, uh, will treat it with callousness. But, Lord, I pray for all of us, Father, that are coming this morning, um, that you would open up our heart to hear your word this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Again, thank you so much for joining us with, this, uh, with our Bible study this morning. And... Um, yeah, excuse our technical difficulties. Sometimes that happens. Um, but again, like I said, my name is Pastor Keith. We're here with Grace Baptist Church. We uh, have our uh, online service uh, each, uh, each week, and we're going through uh, a particular study now about Jesus and his teachings. Um, but we would like to invite you, if you are watching and you live locally and you are able to attend, we would love to worship our Lord Jesus with you. We understand that, of course, you can't always be there. And we're very thankful that you can join us online. What a blessed time we live in that we can share God's word and God's truth and even do it virtually in this, in this case. Um, and if you don't live near us, we're so thankful that you're taking the time to come and to be with us um, as we are going through this study. Very, very thankful. And uh, so we uh, just uh, hope that uh, the Lord is glorified in this. And uh, well, I always like the way uh, the Reverend Fred Luter used to say it. I'm praying that God is glorified, that the saints are edified, and that Satan is horrified, right? Because uh, he does not like the truth. And, um, and uh, so uh, one of the things that Jesus always exhorted us to do, and probably if you are at all familiar with the Lord's model prayer, um, many churches just recite, they recite that every week. Um, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy, thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Um, we start off, obviously, in prayer and praise, exalting God, which is how 
Jesus did that right. And the second thing that Jesus rolls right into when he teaches us to pray is praying for the coming of his kingdom. And what is the kingdom? That's, that's a lot that we can talk about. It's a simple thing, but yet it's also very profound. And we spent several, uh, several months talking about what is the kingdom of God. We have the Kingdom of God series if you want to go back and look at that. You can find us uh, obviously here on Facebook if you're watching it live now. Um, but if you're watching us later, you can also watch us on YouTube. If we have a YouTube channel, Grace, which you, which you need to type in Grace Baptist Church, Cumberland, Maryland, because there's a lot of Grace Baptist Churches on YouTube. You can also find us on Rumble. If you go to rumble.com, Baptist Church, you can also find us uh, there as well. Um, so, uh, and then if you go to our, our church website, which is gracecumberland.org, uh, you can go there and you can watch us there as well. So those are uh, three different places that you can, that you can view the sermons. Uh, and whatever the case is, we're very thankful that you uh, can join us uh, this morning. And so would you join me now as we, we've spent some time exalting God um, at the beginning. Now I want to like to take some time to just pray for the coming of his kingdom. Would you pray with me? Father, we just want to thank you so much for, um, we want to thank you so much for your word. Thank you for your word, which is truth. And Lord, we just want to this morning, Father, acknowledge, Lord, that you are building a kingdom. A kingdom that it's really not visible in the same way that, like, we would see America, or the same way we would see Russia, or uh, India, or Mexico, or Canada, or any of these other nations. Lord, your kingdom is not represented by governments. It's not really even represented by armies. It's not represented by even a great force. There's not even... There's not even a huge monetary backing. There's not like no banks. There's no institutions. Um, Lord, it's, it's something that, Father, to the, the, the beholder, Father, someone who is looking with their physical eyes would not see or understand. And yet you are building this kingdom. And you have, you have unveiled your truth. You have unveiled this ancient wisdom that goes all the way back to the beginning of time. And so we're praying this morning that, Lord, maybe, or, or whenever it is that, some, that we're watch, someone is watching this, Lord, that as your word goes out and as it comes into our heart, that you would change us. Because that is your kingdom, the changed heart, the heart that's been renewed in Christ, the heart that was once deteriorated, destroyed, that came to nothing, and then you, Father, rescued that heart. Lord, you brought us to nothing, and then you showed us how much you loved us, and you restored, Father, and you made our hearts new. This is your kingdom. Spirit of the living God, only you can reveal this. This is the, this gift that you've given us through Jesus Christ. Reveal that now to those who are listening, that they may know the true Jesus. I know, Lord, that we're coming to a time, Lord, when things are happening dramatically in this world. And many of us, Lord, are thinking, wow, and, and, and it's not a new thought because, Lord, even the disciples thought this at the beginning that, 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 that your kingdom was coming like, was like right there on the edge. And, and uh, so we want to just right now, um, as we look at what's happening, we're thinking that, Lord, your kingdom is, is, about, to, is about to come and that, that, that you're, you're coming, that you're, you're going to send your son and it's going to be, um, it's going to be a, a, a amazing, scary and glorious event all at the same time. Um, so prepare us now for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we have been, uh, we just, well, let me just, just, let me just throw out a little caveat here. 
we just uh, upgraded our internet system, so it's hopefully going to be. Um, this is the first time we're using it for this. I'm hoping it's going to be um, better. Did you plug that thing in? The router? Oh, I bet you it's going through my phone. I never plugged the router back in. Excuse me for, for yeah, just the um, yeah. So that means this is going through phone. Well, praise the Lord anyway, right? <laughs> um, so that uh, praise the Lord for good internet connection through cellular, right? <laughs> Um, so in any case, I try to reboot the router each week, and and I forgot this time. Um, and I remembered; I just forgot to plug it back in. Um, in any case, um, so we'll just keep on going. <laughs> Sorry about that. So we've been doing a teaching about Jesus for the last several months, um, who Jesus really is. And uh, thank you for those of you that have stayed with us through this study. Um, it's an honor and a privilege to be able to share God's word with you. I'm, I'm unworthy of that, but I'm thankful that he gives us the chance to do it. And, and you know, listen, we all go out, and when, we, when we've discovered this amazing gift, we, we share it with others, not under compulsion because we, we have to do it. We do it because we want to. We're compelled to do it because of our love for him, because of the love he showed us. And, um, and uh, so I'm thankful for this opportunity to be able to share uh, who Jesus is, right? Because we all have this preconceived idea of who Jesus is, even if we've grown up in a church. Even if we spent a lot of time in Sunday school classes and we spent a lot of time, you know, Jesus, like, as we, as we learned from the Psalm 145 that we were praying from earlier, God's, God is unsearchable. We will spend forever getting to know Him. And and as I've gone through this study myself, God has just opened up my eyes to the greatness of His Son, Jesus, even more than ever. And I'm, I'm excited more than ever. And I hope that, uh, that through this that you may gain more of an understanding of who He is um, and uh, some of the things He's done. We looked at some of the miracles and things. And now we're, now we're spending time talking specifically about some of His teachings, but specifically as it relates to His parables. A good portion um, of his teaching, probably about a third of his teaching, was through the form of parables. And we've been talking about um, particularly some of those ones that we've been learning through, through Matthew. Um, and he's talking about this ancient truth, this ancient wisdom that's been revealed from the beginning of time through these parables. right? And, and we talked about one in the Kingdom of God series which has to do with the seed falling on different ground, if you want to go back and review that one. But then we came back and picked up on, on, on right from that passage, where Jesus reveals God. A lot of people uh, believe, yeah, well, I'm part of the kingdom of God because I go to the church. Well, that's not necessarily the case. And, um, and so we want to, um, to be able to understand that. We've also talked about the miraculous transformation that starts in such a small place, Jesus was using the illustration of the kingdom of God being like a mustard seed, like it's the smallest of all seeds. And, and the kingdom of God is just becoming huge, and it's, and it's the, the driving force that keeps right now even the evil back in a lot of ways. Um, but uh, we, t we spent some time talking about that. We talked about, uh, he talked about the kingdom of God being like yeast, that God infuses new hearts into the people, and he creates in us. Uh, a heart of worship, and he's creating nations. Like every nation is going to one day have radically changes our desires, our confessions, and our ambitions. And um, and uh, so that's what we learned about last week with the two parables that he talked about the 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 the, uh, the parable of the hidden treasure, the man that happened upon it, and then the parable of the precious pearl or the uh, fine pearl. Um, the pearl of great worth and that man that sold everything to get it. So we talked about that and the radical change. And see, understand, see if it switches over. Okay. Okay, I apologize. Again, we uh, just set up this new internet system and... Um, we're, having to, we're trying to get used to that one. Uh, my apologies. Okay, so I'll just pick up where we left off. So the end game. Um, 
Understanding what's coming is important, right? It changes everything. If we have kind of a glimpse into what's coming, it can help us to know. You know, you think about it in the terms of the Titanic, right? You know, when, when it hit the iceberg, you know, it was, it was deemed by so many people as the unsinkable ship. And, uh, and there seemed to be a lot of things in place that would make it appear to be unsinkable, even to the point they were so confident in it that they didn't have enough lifeboats for everybody that was on board. Uh, enough pres uh, life preservation equipment and all that just it was lacking. And, um, and, and of course, what happened? We all know what happened to the Titanic. It sunk. But even during that time, there was people going around, you know, it's sinking. And, and people were not, not really hearing, you know. What, what if people who heard that now, they were listening, they're like, oh, yeah. Like, you know, what, a lot of people don't realize that a lot of the lifeboats in the beginning went out and they were only just had a few people on it. So a lot more people could have been saved if they would have all believed the message and jumped on it right in the beginning. Um, so understanding the end game, understanding what's coming, uh, and it changes us. And so the, the main point we're looking at today is that when we, um, when we, be, when we uh, begin, I'm supposed to say begin, my apologies, I, th I just typed it really fast. When we begin to know the whole story of God's plan to create a new heart in us, we're compelled to share the good news of the ancient gospel. Um, and you're going to, Pastor, what are you talking about? Well, I'm going to explain what we're talking about here in just a little bit. Um, but we're going to be reading from Matthew uh, chapter uh, 13, uh, verses 47 through 52. So if you would, turn in your Bible. It's always good if you are able to. If you can't, that's understandable. Uh, but if you're able to and you have a copy of God's Word, it's good to to have a copy with you that you can see and you can hold and you can read and, and listen and not even be afraid to even mark in it uh, because um, sometimes that can help us in our learning. And so I usually ask folks to stand in honor of the reading of God's Word because this is God's Word. And so we want to honor it by standing and giving, you know, giving it our attention, our complete attention. But I want you to always remember this. Standing is just an outward expression of what's in our heart. We can do things mechanically and say, well, you know, I'm not, I'm going to stand, but I'm not really going to honor God. You know what I'm saying? Like Jesus spoke out about that. So um, if you can't stand, but you're honoring God in your heart, that's cool. There's no judgment on that. I can't see you anyway, right? <laughs> But I'm just asking, if you can, would you stand in honor of reading God's Word? And Abigail will come this morning and read, starting in verse 47. Okay. Parable of the Dragnet. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet that was cast into the sea and gathered some of every kind, which it was full, they drew it to shore. And they sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but threw the bad away. So it will be at the end of age. The angels will come forth, separate the wicked from among the just, and cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing, wailing and gnashing of teeth. Jesus said to them, Have you understood all of these things? They said to him, Yes, Lord. Then he said to them, Therefore, every scribe instructed concerning the kingdom of heaven is like a householder who brings out his treasure Things new and old. Lord, this is the this is the word. This is your word, Lord. Bless the reading of your word. Amen. Thank you very much. So, this is um, part of a discourse that Jesus has been giving. Um, there's been a mixed audience that's been listening, right? Some people who are his ardent followers. They are his disciples, the ones he's called. Um, and then there's other people who are there who are. Uh, just listeners, standbyers, there's people who are uh, actually even opposed and against Jesus. And, and uh, we learned about why he taught in parables. Um, we're not going to go into that today because we've talked about that before. But, um, but, we, but what, why he taught in you know, these hidden truths um, out in the open. Um, and so this is the context now that this particular uh, parable that he's giving is at the end of a discourse. He's been talking about the how the kingdom of God comes about, what it's going to look like, what it's, 
what are the characteristics of the kingdom of God. And, 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 and uh, so this is kind of the end one. And it's kind of interesting. He says, and it's not, it's not, it's not a huge passage, but he says, um, excuse me, one again. He says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a large net, uh, and uh, is thrown into the sea. Now, most of us are not fishermen, right? When I think of fishing, I go out with a fishing pole and a string, and I and I, I pick up one fish at a time. I've been fortunate, we've had two hooks and I've caught two fish at a time before, but typically um, that's not exactly what he's referring to. He's referring to um, the large net, which is called a, a, a drag net. A drag net is uh, what you hear about, um, or not, not drag net, the, the uh, guy that's, um, not the guy that, uh, the, the police guy, but right. But a drag net is, um, the word there he's using is a large fishing dragnet that is used worked a lot of times by two boats sometimes it's by people and then it separates and it swings back in the shore now this is kind of a, a hand drawing here of, of potentially what a dragnet can look like with people here's uh, some people here and some people here and you see the net what they do is they they grab each and they throw the net out in the water and then they pull it and what happens is is that everything that is in the way of the net because there's there's floaters on the top of the net that f that keep the net from uh, sinking, right? So nothing can swim over the net, and it's also deep enough that it goes down to the bottom, so that captures so everything that comes into that net. It captures, and what Jesus is saying, this is what the kingdom of God is like. You know, it, it's it collects every kind of fish, right? So nothing can escape it. And then he describes it here. He says, so when it was full, they dragged it ashore. They sat down and gathered the good fish into containers, right? So there is a, if, if you notice the detail that he's got going on, what happened? So the net was full, obviously, right? Uh, and then what did they do? Once it, they dragged it to the shore, so there's the work of bringing it in. And then it says they sat down. It shows some of the intentionality. Of, they know that they're going to be there for a while, so they're sitting down into a relaxed position so they can do some work. What is the work? They're gathering the good fish. And they're putting them into containers. So two things. They're gathering the good fish. They're putting them into containers. Because what's going to happen? They're going to take them. They're going to go to market. So there's this deliberate, intentional purpose. They have these fish because they're going to go do something with them. They're going to be a benefit to the community. They're going to be a benefit to their families. Um, they're, they're definitely a ser uh, they're providing a service. Um, but then there's the other side of it. It says, but they threw out the worthless ones. Right, so there's going to be obviously some kinds of things in there. It could be some trash, or it could be fish that are not edible, um, or it could be just you know whatever. They that's not going to go to market, and so they're just going to throw those out. So Jesus is painting this picture, so you get this idea in your head. And some there's some fishermen, some people who uh, who are who are this way, uh, and they understand this process. Where for us we don't we don't really understand it, right? But Jesus said this. He says, he, what he's doing, he's pointing towards the end times. He said, so it will be at the end of the age. He's wanting the reader to understand the end game, the end picture. There's a purpose for this. There's a reason for what's happening. And he says, the angels will go out and they will separate. There's that word there. Separate what? The evil people from the righteous. Right? So there's the the good fish and the bad fish. Um, so what's going to happen? Look at it. He says right there. He says in the bad, bad fish, he's going to throw them into a blazing furnace where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And that's the end of what he's talking about. And, and that's kind of like a, like seems almost like a bizarre way to end this discourse. Um, now this, this harkens back to what Jesus said earlier uh, when we were studying one of the other passages, uh, when he talks about at the end in, in verse 40, when he said, therefore, uh, when he talks about the weeds and the grass, he said, the weeds are gathered up and burned in the fire, so that at the end of the age, the Son of Man will send out his angels and they will gather from his kingdom all who cause sin and guilty of lawlessness, and they will be thrown into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So why why does Jesus... First of all, the question we have to ask is, why does Jesus end this discourse 
with a talk about the coming judgment. And I think it's simple. When, when you have kids, if you're, if you're a parent, or even if you're a babysitter, or even if you're in charge of people who are younger, or if you're an experience in a job position or for something, you know there's particular dangers in that job. And so what do you do? When you're training somebody, you try to explain to them what are the dangers, what are, what are the impending dangers. You want to keep people from falling into a trap that could cause them to be hurt or even worse, even lose their life, right? So when we're raising our kids, we say, you know, don't go play in the street. Why? Because if you play in the street, something bad might happen to you. You could, you could, you could be killed. And, um, and so uh, it's, it's this way. Jesus is saying, listen, I want you to understand that there is a coming judgment. God said that even to Adam and Eve all the way back in the beginning. He said, man, I've, he gave them everything and told them, listen, you can eat from the tree of life and you will live forever. Oh, but also understand, if you eat of the tree of knowledge and evil, you're going to die. He gave them a warning. He wasn't saying that because he was trying to pronounce some kind of judgment on them or he was trying to, he was trying to help them to understand the preciousness of his word and that to drift away from him, to drift away from his word was to, to not have life and, to, and it would lead to death. And so this is, this is the kind of warning that, that Jesus is giving. Jesus, the God of all glory, who comes down, takes on the form of a human being, and he's living with us, and he's giving us these words. And again, people like to, you know, this, when we come back to that picture about, you know, who Jesus is, and what do we think he's going to do, and like a lot of people say, well, you know, I don't want to talk about this subject about hell or about this coming judgment, because, because it's, it quite frankly is uncomfortable, and this, this might be a very uncomfortable message to listen to. Um, but hopefully you're going to see the, the amazingness of the whole thing in the end. But, uh, but why, why does Jesus talk about at the end this way? Because he wants in the end to understand. He wants his disciples to understand what is going to happen at the end. You notice he says he separates the good, the, uh, the evil from the good. He's, in other words, what does he do? He's taking out all of the bad. It's not, it's not a picture of taking out the good. He's taking the bad out. And, and there's going to be a judgment. And that's what he spent. He doesn't he didn't go into a discourse about what happens with the good people, what happens with the righteous people. He didn't go into that. He doesn't talk about that at all. Why? He's giving this, this, this very distinct warning about what's going to happen. And, um, and this is not uncommon, right? Because like I said, he did that already in this very same chapter. Um, we see that uh, he says uh, in, in the Gospel of Mark, for example, there's also a warning, right? He talks about, he gives the illustration better if, you know, he gives the illustration about, you know, cutting off your hands if it's causing you to sin, you know, be better than face that than go in the hole, uh, than to, to, to be consumed in unquenchable fire. He talks about um, in the Gospel of Luke, when he says, don't fear those who can kill the body, right? But, but rather the one who can destroy your soul in hell. Um, we see in Jude, Jude is giving a warning. He says, likewise, Solomon, Solom, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns committed uh, sexual immorality and perversion serve as examples of by undergoing punishment of eternal fire. You know, um, over and over, and we see that in Revelation. Revelation chapter 20, it says, Death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And anyone whose name was not found in the, in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. But even in the Old Testament, we see a lot of this discussion. For example, in Proverbs chapter 15, it says, Sheol and Abdon were before, lie before the Lord, and how much more human hearts. In 20, Proverbs 27, 20, Sheol and Abdon, these are other words referring to hell, are never satisfied, and the people's eyes are never satisfied. Jeremiah even gave warning over and over, th all throughout the Old Testament, talking about the Lord's decoration, talking about um, the bones of kings and officials and, and all those, and that they're going to they, they expose the, the sin being exposed in the coming judgment. Uh, in Matthew chapter 3, we see he talks about the winnowing fork that's in his hand and the threshing of, of that. John the Baptist talks about that. Uh, in Matthew chapter 5, um, he says, uh, I mean, he's talking about you know, elaborating on the law, right? And he talks about, you know, hating your brother. If you just hate him, you know, that's like killing, you know, like murder. 
and uh, he says it's better to not sin, better to cut your hand off and than be thrown into the lake of fire. Or Matthew chapter 7, he talks about the narrow gate, the few there be that find it, but broad is the road that what leads to destruction. Um, in Matthew chapter 8, he talks about um, the, the many religious people who thought they were part of God's kingdom and they're not. And he says, um, he says but some... But the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Um, or further on in Matthew chapter 8, he says, um, uh, he was talking about the Gadarene demoniac, which we studied about in the past. Um, and it says, suddenly that these demons, they came to Jesus, right? They were in there and they said, um, they were like, dude, um, what have you to do with us, son of God? They knew who Jesus was. They said, have you come to torment us before our time? Here were evil demons who understood that there was a coming judgment. Um, Matthew 10, again, don't fear the ones who can destroy the body, um, but fear the one who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Uh, Matthew chapter 11, uh, he pronounced, remember we studied this too, he talked about pronouncing a curse on uh, Chorazin and Bethsaida, and as well as the Capernaum. Here Jesus did all these miracles in these cities. And uh, he pronounced judgment upon them. He said, you know, you guys, you guys did not follow. Uh, you guys, here was the Son of God. I came and I revealed myself. I revealed the Father to you. And yet you didn't even care. Um, and then it goes on and on and on. And we see Matthew chapter 18, Matthew chapter 22, Matthew chapter 23, Matthew chapter 24, Matthew chapter 25. Over and over and over and over again, Jesus spends a lot of time talking about the coming judgment. So, so why does he end this discourse about the coming judgment? Because he wants us to be aware of that. And even so, why does Jesus spend so much time talking about hell? Because he wants people to understand the reality of the truth of what's coming. And if we understand the end game, it changes the whole way we think about everything. And see, that's what he's talking to his disciples about, trying to help them to understand the big picture of what's going on, the spiritual picture. And he says in verse 51, um, Have you understood all these? And they answered him, Yes. Right? Do you understand? Of course, they still haven't gotten everything. Later, he's, he questions them, right? Even later in this gospel, he says, do you still not understand? But, uh, but they're understanding what's going on. He says, but then he says in verse 52, Therefore, he said to them, Every teacher of the law has become a disciple of the kingdom of heaven, is like a homeowner, like the owner of a house, who brings out his storehouse treasures new and old. So uh, what, he, what he's talking about, teachers of the law, right? Teachers of the law. So the word there is uh, grammarius, the Greek word. It's just one word. In some translations, in, in this one, it translated teachers of the law. Some, sometimes they call them scribes. Um, different uh, translations, they're all, it's, they're all good. But um, in essence, the this, this sense of it is a learned person who was able to read and write, probably with the focus on the teaching of the meaning of the written documents. In other words, someone who uh, was more than just someone who can read and write, but they have, their intention was to be able to elaborate and to communicate on the thing that was written. And uh, so what he's saying is, is this kind of person becomes what? This kind of person becomes a disciple. A disciple, ma, ma teo, right? a person who becomes instructed in the ways of a specific teacher or leader. And, but, what, but what specifically? It is specifically becomes a disciple or someone who is in the kingdom of heaven. In other words, someone who's learning these ancient truths and the way of God. So someone who understands these ancient truths becomes this teacher of the law. And this is how he describes what they're like. He says they're like what? The owner of a house. The word there. You can look at it for yourself. I'm not even going to try to pronounce it. I have no idea. But I wanted you to see that that is actually just one word. Um, it just means master of a house or a householder. So, but the idea is the master whose sphere of authority um, 
is the house estate and all the things that go with it. In other words, they own the house, they own everything that goes in it, and so they are able to, um, to, to exercise all those things in conjunction with that. And, um, and so um, that's, that's what he's talking about, right? So if you own your own house, for example, uh, you're in control. You know what's in your house. You, you are able to, to exercise all those kinds of things. Uh, when a guest comes in, you, you can, if, if they have a need, you're able to meet those needs because you, you have all of those things. But he says, uh, but he says, so the master of the house who, who what, uh, brings out his uh, storeroom treasures. Now that word there is also just one word. Um, the, it's a, what it means is a repository or a treasure room. It's like uh, an interior room used for storage of goods. So he's saying, so someone who has this, they have, it's like, like they have a, an ancient treasure and they have a, they've been entrusted with something that's great. And so in that, in that person, they have a treasure trove of information. And, but he says specifically new and old. What is he talking about? You see, he's talking, remember, to his disciples who are Jews. Jews have been entrusted with the Word of God. They have been, from ancient times up until now, they have been carrying the Old Testament, which was God's revelation to mankind. God revealed Himself through to Moses. God revealed Himself to Abraham. God revealed Himself through all these prophets all throughout the centuries. And then, of course, who comes ultimately is Jesus. Jesus comes to reveal the Father. And so that's the old and the new. We understand the, the new is a completing of the old. And so here, um, here's basically what he's saying. So the ancient truth that has been revealed is in the Old Testament, but it's made clear from what Jesus came to reveal about who the Father was. We'll talk more about that in a second. Uh, Augustine, one of the, four, one of the uh, fathers of the church, put it this way. He says, and now... The voice of Christ speaks to the Jews through the voice of the old scriptures. They hear the voices of those old scriptures, but they do not see the face of the one who speaks, right? Because Jesus hadn't come yet. Do they want the veil to be lifted? Let them come to the Lord. Thus, the old things are not taken away, but hidden in a storeroom. The learned scribe now is, is now the kingdom of God, bringing forth from his storeroom not the new things only, not the old things only. For if he should bring forth the new things only, or the old things only, he is not a learned scribe in the kingdom of God, presenting from his storeroom these new and old, right? So in other words, if we don't understand the Old Testament, if we don't understand the New Testament, I mean, if we don't understand that this is all God's plan and revelation, then we're not understanding the whole truth. Remember on the road to Emmaus, right? So one of the there were some disciples who were walking along. Jesus had just died, and he had been resurrected. And Jesus walked up to them, and they were discussing these things. And and, and they're like, their hearts are heavy. And Jesus is like, what? Why are your hearts so heavy? And they're like, dude, haven't you heard everything that's been going on? And then what did Jesus do? He went back to the Old Testament, and he explained everything from the very beginning what God intended. And their hearts were like amazed. They were like, wow, this guy is amazing. And then finally at the end they realized, oh wow, this was Jesus. This was the Messiah, you see. And then uh, Augustine ends with this. He says, we therefore come to the Lord that the veil may be removed. We understand God's ancient wisdom when we understand who Jesus Christ is. As a matter of fact, Jesus said this in his prayer in John chapter 17. He said, righteous Father, the world has not known you. However, I have known you, and they have known that you sent me. I made your name known to them and will continue to make it known. So when we think about the teacher of the law, who is the teacher of the law? They are those who understand the ancient truth that Jesus came to reveal, right? And so this brings us back to our main point. When we begin to know the whole story of God's plan to create in us a new heart, we're compelled to want to go share that good news of the ancient gospel. It moves us to want to go do that. It becomes part of who we are, a fabric of, of, of everything about who, who we are. 
Now, I would like to jump back to verse 49. Do you remember when it says the angels will go out and separate the evil people from the righteous? I want to ask you this question. How does one become righteous? And it's easy for us to think, well, by doing the right thing. If I can become a good enough person, if I go to church, some people make the idea that because I go to church regularly that they're righteous. But the truth, the reality is, is that if we really come to the place where we understand, listen, we, we, we can, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of good people on this earth, a lot of good people. And we walk around and we judge ourselves comparing ourselves with others. And sometimes we can really elevate ourselves to a good position where we actually really, really look good. But the reality is, is that the Bible teaches us that even the good things we do are not enough to earn favor with God. So, how do we become righteous? We become righteous by what Jesus did on the cross. Here's part, here's the continuation of that prayer. He said, I have come to make you, uh, he says, remember what he says? I, I made your name known to them and will continue to make it new, known. Why? So that the love you have loved me with may be in them and I may be in them. In other words, Father, if they, if when I become your example of obedience and righteousness, you have loved me because of that. You have loved me because I've been obedient all the way even to the point of death on a cross. Because of that, Lord, now that same love that you've loved me with, you're going to give it to those same people. And so now, Father, your love is going to be in them. Can you see, when God, how does God, how do I know God loves me? Not because of the righteous things I've done. Man, I, I've screwed up a, a right many things. God loves me because I'm trusting in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. I don't have my own righteousness. I can only trust, we can only trust in His righteousness, you see. So the only way to be counted among the righteous is to have the righteousness that God gives us through His Son, Jesus Christ. And maybe that's where you're at this morning. You're saying, well, Pastor, I, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not that good a person. I don't, I don't go to church. And I don't do this thing. I don't, listen, you are closer to the kingdom of God than you realize. Because it's only when you come to that place where you're actually really broken, you really understand the nature of, your, of, of our sin, of our fallenness. When we come to that place, when we begin to understand what Jesus came to do, when we understand that we deserve death, when we understand that we deserve, his, uh, when we deserve punishment, then we begin to the, come to the place where we're saying, listen, well, well, sometimes we're tempted just to cover it up and say, no, it doesn't matter, I don't have that. Or the other side is, is we realize what God's plan of redemption is and we, we trust in that, you see. But maybe, maybe you're listening this morning and you say, well, Pastor, I am a believer. What does this mean for me? As believers, we're entrusted with this ancient truth that we eagerly want to share with others. Because you see why. I, the best way I've heard it was a, a, a friend uh, from our, a, a lady from our church, she, she comes regular and um, she said it's like, it's like a beggar sharing the uh, source, source of bread with other beggars. Right? I, I'm not explaining this to you from a position of righteousness. I'm not any better than you are. I'm just as big, as, if not bigger sinner than you are. But I, I'm just trying to show you who's the one that came and made the way for me. And, uh, and so that's why we're here. That's why we want to continue to share this message with you. That's why Jesus wanted to leave this word with his disciples. This is why he mentions it all throughout the Old Testament, why hell is talked about all throughout the New Testament, because it's a warning. It's not a popular message, but it's a warning to what's coming. And if you've made it this far, thank you for continuing to listen. And I just want to pray this morning that you would hear what the Spirit of God is speaking to you this morning. If the Spirit of God is moving in your heart right now and He's revealing to you, yes, Jesus really is the one. He is the way. He is God's plan. 
for redemption and salvation. He has God's plan for you and for me to give us the righteousness that we need. Jesus obeyed perfectly in a way that we can't. And when we trust that, that is enough to carry us through this judgment. That's how we will get through the judgment. You see, when we talked about earlier in, in, the, in Revelation, if you remember well, the passage that I read, it says death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire, and anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown in the, the lake of fire. What, what is the book of life? That is this. All those who have trusted in Jesus Christ, their names are in a book. See, in the judgment time, there's going to be two books. There's going to be a book of our deeds, and then there's going to be a book of life. The book of deeds is this. Everything that we've done that we have to give an account for. And listen, what's the greatest of all these? The greatest sin that we can have is to know who Jesus Christ is and to reject that gift. By the same token, by the opposite side is, is that the greatest gift we have is to know that Jesus is our hope, that He is God's plan for redemption. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for those who have come to join us this morning. We pray that, Lord, you'll take this word. We pray that, Lord, that you be glorified in this. Um, Lord, and if there's one that does not know you, Father, that today would be the day that they would say, yes, I want to know and I want to have this gift of righteousness that Jesus has come to give me. When I stand before God, when I stand before you, Father, I stand, Lord, not, not clothed in my righteousness, not clothed in my deeds, not clothed in, in the things that I do, but, Father, clothed in perfect righteousness. And so, Father, I want to just pray that today, Lord, that there will be those who hear who today they will receive that gift, that robe of righteousness. And for those, Lord, who say, you know, who, who already say, you know, I've already trusted Jesus. Today they would be strengthened in their walk and our resolve. That, Lord, that this, like, just me being reminded, Father, again, that each one of us were reminded about the end, about what's happening in the end. It reminds us that we can need to continually be vigilant, vigilant about your grace on us. We need to continue to be vigilant about how we were once in that place on the road to destruction and how, Father, you saved us from it. And vigilant and, and reminding us, Father, Spirit of the living God, reminding us about the spiritual truth that, that we live, that there is a coming judgment. And Lord, we want others to hear this message before it's too late. So, Father, we thank you. To you be the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you again so much for uh, for joining us. And uh, listen, uh, you know we we uh, uh, everything costs, right? And um, and if you are if you are blessed and you're willing to to share in this ministry, we would be appreciative and thankful for anything that you would want to give. There's no requirement to do it, but if God is speaking to you and your heart is filled with joy from the Word of God, you've been uh, tapped into the and you want to give back, here's, here's one way of many, obviously, that you can do. You can give back if you could send some money to 211 Green Street, Cumberland, Maryland. Or if you have a smartphone, you could scan that barcode, and, um, and that will take you right to our giving page. We would be very thankful for whatever gift that you were able to send. Thank you so much. God bless you. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to write or leave a message. But thank you for joining us this morning.